So children, today we're going to talk about a time where Jesus was teaching people and then the Pharisees came and asked him a question. Now what do we know about the scribes and Pharisees? What are they like? They're not usually good. So their, their questions for him were not necessarily very friendly questions, but they asked an interesting question. And so the Pharisees therefore said to Jesus, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. So they were saying, you are telling us these things, but you're the only one saying them. So we're not going to trust you because you're the only one saying them. And Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law, the testimony of two men is true. And I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. And they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. He is challenging them and saying that he has two witnesses. He is a witness himself, and the Father is a witness as well. This happens a little bit later. It says, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, so not like the Pharisees, but the people who were following and believing him, he says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants. We have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits a sin is the slave of sin. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. So this story starts with a question about witnesses. Does anyone know what a witness means? Do you know what a witness means? Yeah. Yeah, someone who saw it happen, and then they're able to tell other people what really happened. So a witness back in the ancient time was very important because they didn't have videos. They probably didn't even have a whole lot of writing things that they could write down what had happened, so they relied on people who had seen it happen to be able to tell. And if there was a question about what had really happened, they would ask for a witness. But they had a rule that you couldn't just have one witness. You needed at least two witnesses in order for someone to believe you. They had to have two witnesses. And so they came to Jesus and said, we don't trust what you're teaching. We don't want to believe you. And you're the only one who seems to be saying it. Because all the Pharisees, they were teachers too, but they were teaching differently than Jesus. So they said, we don't want to believe you. You don't have any extra witnesses. We need to have at least two witnesses. So Jesus says, I give you my witness and the witness of the Father. Now that's a little bit confusing because... The Father they were talking about was God. And so how would God give a witness to what Jesus was saying? They couldn't go up to heaven and ask him, so how were they expected to get a witness from the Father? So Jesus, when he was talking to them, he would teach them in parables. And even here he's teaching in a parable, meaning he's telling them about something that we understand on earth, but he's really talking about something from heaven. So when he says the Father is a witness, We need to think about what does he mean? What does a father feel about his children? Do you know? He loves them. He wants to protect them. He wants to help them. So when he says the father is a witness, he's talking about love. He's saying love is the witness that you should be trusting. And so this is saying for us, if we're not sure, can we believe in the Lord? Can we believe in the Word? One of the witnesses we should look for is love. Do we have love? Do we have love for other people? That is a witness that the Lord is with us. So you might be wondering, am I doing the right thing? Am I on the right path that the Lord wants me to be on? 
And if you find love in your heart, that is a witness. Now, there's another witness. It says there's two witnesses. There's the Father who is love, and the other witness we can look for is the witness of the Son, and that in the Word means truth. So, love is one witness, and truth is another witness. So, we can look in the Word and find the truth. You say, is this something right or wrong? How do we know? Because lots of people have different opinions, and you have people arguing back and forth, and you say, well, which one's right? You can go back to the Word and look for the truth in the Word and see if that can show you what is right. But you don't just trust the truth by itself. You don't just trust love by itself. You want to have both witnesses together in order to know what's right and wrong. So the Lord has given us our minds. He's given us our hearts. And when we have the Lord's love and His truth, if we have them together in our life, that's when we know we're on the right path. That's when we know we're doing the right thing. So sometimes it can be hard. Sometimes it can be hard to know what we're supposed to do. Sometimes you have to make a decision about your career in the future or who you want to be friends with, and you can look for the Lord's love and wisdom, not by themselves, but together. And that says, is when the Lord says you have the two witnesses and they'll tell you what is right, what is the truth, is if you have love and wisdom together. Amen. We read further from the Gospel of John, a court, uh, number five. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You said to John, he bore witness to the truth. And yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the bright and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's, for the works which my Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me. The Father has sent me, and the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have not heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form, but you do not have his abiding word in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me, but you were not willing to come to me that you might have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. But I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe in me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you then believe my words? Let me read further from Jeremiah chapter 17. Blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river. He will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green. And will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. And finally, we read from the doctrine of faith. Faith is an internal acknowledgement of truth. At the present day, the term faith is taken to mean mere thought that a thing is so because the church so teaches and because it is not evident to the understanding. For we are told to believe and not to doubt. And if we say we do not com comprehend, we are told that this is just the reason for believing. And so the faith of the present day is a faith in the unknown, and it may be called blind faith. And as it is something that somebody has said in somebody else, it is faith of hearsay. It will be seen presently that this is not spiritual faith. Real faith is nothing else than the acknowledgement that the thing is so because it is true. For one who is in real faith thinks and says, this is true, and therefore I believe it. 
For faith is of truth, and truth is of faith. If a person does not see the truth in a thing, he says, I do not know whether it is true. Therefore, I as yet do not believe it. How can I believe what I do not intellectually comprehend? Perhaps it is false. Hence it is now that those who are in the spiritual affection for truth have an internal acknowledgement of it. And as the angels are in that affection, they utterly reject the dogma that the understanding should be kept subject to faith. For they say, what is it to believe a thing and not to see whether it is true? If anyone declares that it still must be believed, they reply, do you think that you are God whom I ought to believe or that I am mad to believe an assertion in which I do not see any truth? Cause me, therefore, to see it. So the dogmatic one retires. Angelic wisdom consists solely in this, that angels see and comprehend what they think. Amen. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Jesus said, I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So we might wonder, what does faith actually mean? Are we supposed to believe in the Lord, in heaven and hell, on blind faith? Or can we look for some kind of conclusive proof of their existence? In the gospel, according to John, we, we read that the Lord says that we shouldn't trust his witness alone. But because the Father is also a witness, then we should trust. It might seem like a strange thing for the Lord to say when so much of the rest of the gospels and the word is focused on the emphasis that the Lord is one and that Jesus and the Father are one. Also, we can say, well, what does that mean? How could the Father be a witness? How is that a helpful proof? If people did not believe in Jesus, who was standing in front of them, how could they believe something from the Father who was invisible to them? What evidence could God add? And we might think, actually, we're in a far more difficult position today because we don't have Jesus in front of us or the Father. We have to rely on what is written down in the Word. Now, to the Jewish church, though, the idea of God the Father, or Yahuwah, was a real and important concept to them. They understood from their scriptures, and they thought they knew about who He was. But what they did not see was how the evidence of the Word and the Scripture was supporting Jesus' own testimony and His teaching. They had not seen the Father, as Jesus said to them. They didn't really know. So they had the Scriptures, but they didn't really know the God of the Scriptures. Um, and they couldn't understand how their Scriptures, which had written, written hundreds and perhaps thousands of years earlier or over the course of those years, how could that apply to Jesus, someone standing in front of them? They did not see the connection. But they were actually missing the point. Jesus wasn't trying to convince people to believe in him based on two different people's testimony. If you think about someone coming and saying that they were God, and you'd been living your life all wrong and you need to change everything, it wouldn't really matter to you if a second person came along and said, yes, that person is God, you should believe them. That wouldn't be very convincing. So Jesus is actually pointing to something different. Jesus was referring back to the spiritual origin of the law that they had in the Old Testament Scriptures. There was the policy that you had to have at least two witnesses to confirm something as true. So why were there two witnesses? It wasn't that two people were more reliable than one, although that is also true. The testimony of two witnesses is referring back to the spiritual idea. When we have the testimony of the Father to back Him up, He's talking about the testimony of divine love. And then when he refers to his own testimony, he's talking about divine truth. And in the Lord's ministry, which he pointed to, you can see that in the way he came to heal and save people and also to teach them. He was relying on the witness of his works, what he was doing and showing them. He was teaching them the truth, the true understanding of the word, and he was healing people 
showing them that his mission was to save people both from spiritual and natural ailments. So this testimony, the idea of the two testimonies or the two witnesses, it's teaching us that the things that we believe, the things that we do and base our life on, they should be founded on these two together. Many terrible things have been done when people try to make decisions based on truth without love. When love is removed from the truth, evil comes in to fill the void, and then the truth is falsified. It's turned to falsity. And terrible and misguided things have been done in the name of love, not joined to truth. When truth is absent, then falsity fills the void, and that good is also turned to evil. So our beliefs, they should be based on what is true and good, or what comes from the Lord's divine love and wisdom together. Still, we might say, well, how does that actually help us? How does that help us when we're, when we're maybe questioning the very existence of God, whether we should believe at all, or at least whether we should believe in this specific church? We need to observe, what does the witness of the Father or divine love tell us? Well, from the heavenly doctrine, we know that everything in creation was created from this love. And we can look around us and see evidence of the Lord's love. The Lord created the earth as a home for us. We are born into families and societies, communities, so that we can share the Lord's love with others. If we want to know whether a specific belief or action is right, we can compare it to this standard, this witness of divine love. Is this belief, is this action consistent with the Lord's desire to bring everyone into a happy state in heaven? We can look and see people say, well, you've got to treat this person this way, or you have to treat me this way. And you can think, well, it might seem loving to do that, but is that consistent with the Lord's desire for their salvation, His path towards heaven? That is what should be most important. So loving people means helping them on the path to heaven. If the alcoholic says, give me money to buy drinks, it might seem loving to say, well, here you go. I'll give you just what you want. But if what they want isn't consistent with the Lord's goal for them, you can't be loving them to help them on their path. You need to help them on the Lord's path. So anything that is truly loving is going to come from His love and look to eternal happiness. We read, the divine providence regards eternal ends, and not temporary ones unless they also accord with the eternal ones. So that's the first witness, the witness of love. We can also observe the witness of the Son, or divine truth. Any idea or action should be justified as consistent with truth and reason. When we read the heavenly doctrines, there are many times where we're told, this is the evidence from Scripture, And then here is the evidence from reason. Think about it. One of those things that we are told repeatedly is think about there being one God. It's rationally and logically consistent to believe in one God, but not in three separate persons. And also, we can say the fact that we have a mind that's able to rationalize and think about different things, that in itself is evident that we are able to receive truth from the Lord. It is evidence of the Lord's wisdom. We read in the Psalms, I will confess thee, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy deeds, and my soul knows this exceedingly. So our ability to understand reason and see reason is evidence that the one who created us has all wisdom. We have this ability to reason. Our minds are inclined to believe in and look for the truth. It's very difficult to find people who don't care about the truth. Now, they might have their own perspective or even misunderstandings, but they still are looking for the truth. And we believe. We believe that there's purpose to our life. We believe that there is order in the universe around us. If we are wise, we are aware that there are limits to our understanding, but we don't doubt that there is such a thing as truth. Even scientists who might not believe in God, they have this idea that the universe, it's reasonable and governed by laws. 
even if they don't know what they all are. Many have also pursued this idea of a grand unifying theory that explains how the forces of gravity, light, space, energy, and time all relate to some simple principle or law. There's this underlying sense that this universe has purpose and reason. We can't really escape that. Our minds are drawing us towards this idea that there is a truth, there is a purpose. Now, if we want to evaluate any specific idea, we can compare it to the simple laws of the Lord's truth. These laws, these underlying laws that there is a God, He is one. The Lord Jesus Christ is that one who came into the world to teach us the way to heaven and that His commandments should be obeyed. This comes to one of the more amazing witnesses that the Lord asks us to consider. He gives us the witness of our own lives. We might not notice this or think about this, but repeatedly through Scripture, we're, talking, we're told to confess the Lord, to talk about what He has done. He says to us, if we obey His Word, we will know the truth. So when we live according to His teachings, we will see it as the truth. He says the truth will set us free. When we live according to the commandments, that are given to us in the Word, our lives become free, free from the influences of hell, and we will become happy. Now, the Lord doesn't guarantee us natural success, but we can feel that spiritual freedom, that spiritual lightness that comes from following His teachings. So everything, everything in our own lives can become a witness, a confirmation of the Lord. He's given us the ability to experience his love. So when we do what is right, when we care for other peoples and put their needs ahead of our own, we feel the Lord's love in us as joy. We have reason, intelligence. We can see the truth of what the Lord teaches us. So even if we don't feel the truth, we can understand it and know it and say, this makes sense, even if it doesn't agree with what I feel like right now. When we put our feet on that path that the Lord has given us, everything becomes more and more obvious that it is the Lord leading us. But how do we get started on that path? Do we have to start from blind faith? How do we start? The Lord is telling us not to trust to blind faith. We should understand. True faith is not just blindly following something, but believing in Him, trusting in Him, because it is true, because he is right. I'm going to read a selection from the true Christian religion, talking about faith in this memorable relation. There was seen a round temple, the roof of, roof of which was crown-shaped, and its walls continuous windows of crystal. The door was a pearly substance. There was a pulpit on which there was the Word enveloped in a sphere of light. In the center of the temple was a sanctuary, and before which was a veil at that time raised, and where stood a cherub waving a sword in his hand. When this had been seen, it was explained to me that what each particular thing signified, which now may be seen. Above the gate there was this inscription, Nunc Licet, now it is permitted, which signified that it is now permitted to enter understandingly into the mysteries of faith. And it was given to me to perceive that it's exceedingly dangerous to enter with the understanding into dogmas of faith, which are from self-intelligence and thus falsities, and still more to confirm these from the Word. And therefore, by the divine providence, the Word has been taken away from the Roman Catholics, and with the Protestants it has been closed by their dogma that the understanding is to be kept under obedience to their faith. But because the dogmas of the new church are all from the Word, it is permitted to enter into these with the understanding, because they are continuous truths from the Word, and they shine also before the understanding. This was what is meant by the writing above the gate, now it is permitted, and by the veil of the sanctuary being raised, within which the cherub stood. And after this there was brought to me a paper from an infant who was an angel in the third heaven, on which was written, Enter hereafter hereafter into the mysteries of the Word, which have heretofore been shut up, 
for the particular truths therein are so many mirrors of the Lord. We are invited to use understanding to discover the Lord, but it's not our own understanding or understanding from our self-intelligence. We need to discover Him in His own terms in the Word. So why should we have faith? Why do we have faith in the Word that the Lord is there? And again, we can go back to those witnesses. Again, back to the question. Do we believe in the Word first? Do we have blind faith? Or do we trust because of what is there, because of what is true? Now, we are told that we can't have proof in the sense that something will convince us against our own will or against our own reason. That would take away our freedom, which the Lord values above all else. Instead of proof, we do have freedom, but that freedom itself is a kind of proof. If we were mere animals, if we were mere biological machines, we wouldn't have freedom. We couldn't make choices and see things according to our own reason. The Lord gives us the freedom to choose. If we choose to follow the Lord in the Word, we We can't find find the evidence that we need, both in the Word and in our lives. Again, we read in the Arcana Celestia, or the Secrets of Heaven, this is the case with doctrinal things of faith among men, namely, that there are two principles from which they can think, a negative and an affirmative. Those who think from the negative principle believe nothing unless they are convinced by what is of reason and memory knowledge, nay, by what is of their senses. But those think from the affirmative who believe that things are true because the Lord has said so in the Word, and thus they have faith in the Lord. They who are in the negative in regard to a thing being true because it is in the Word say in heart they will believe when they are persuaded by things of rational and memory knowledges. But the fact is that they will never believe. Indeed, they would not believe if they were to be convinced by the bodily senses of sight, hearing, and touch, for they would always form new reasonings against such things. They would thus end by completely extinguishing all faith, and at the same time turning the light of rational into darkness, because into falsities. But those who are in the affirmative, that is, who believe things are true because the Lord has said so, are continually being confirmed. Their ideas are enlightened and strengthened by what is of reason and memory knowledge, and even by what is of their senses. For man has light from no other source than by means of the things of reason and memory, and such is the way with everyone. So the Lord is telling us He's not going to give us compelling evidence such that we are convinced against our will to believe, but He has given us freedom. He has given us rationality which enables us to find His love and wisdom at work in our lives and in His Word. And if we are willing to see it, we can look for and see the marriage of the Lord's divine good and truth at work in His creation all around us. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Please rise. Glory be to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one God of heaven and earth. Of His kingdom there shall be no end. Amen.